Well, hello boys and girls, Bob in one KPR. And uh well this this is supposed to be a quickie. I was just talking to a friend of mine uh about uh oh well, this is really complicated. We have been servicing radios here on and off for a long time. Uh thirty, forty years now at least. And uh we were talking about the number of, that we've uh, fixed be, due to uh, static buildup on antennas, uh, running an antenna, especially infed antennas, into the house and plugging your portable radio in, or even some of the uh, commercial radios, you know, the desktop sets. Um, and it's getting worse because lately uh, they're using uh, some really high gain, low noise devices solid-state devices, but they're, uh, they're sensitive. They're, uh, they're not as robust as the old bipolar transistors and so on. Uh, the ICs, the MIMIC chips, and the FETs uh, aren't going to take the abuse of a static discharge. So uh, we've, <laughs> we've fixed a lot of those, and it takes me back to my days you know, of the, uh, uh, the San Gen 803, an excellent Beautiful, beautiful portable radio. Uh, that's the realistic 440, uh, pretty much. Uh, and replacing front end transistors and those things, and some of the uh, some of the other uh, commercial, you know, SWL, and uh, to some extent even ham radio. And we've had a few with transceivers go out. Uh, the other thing is, if uh, it's winter time and you're wearing uh, wool or uh, I don't know some kind of funny socks, and you walk across the carpet, and you happen to zap your radio, especially on the antenna rod, you may do some damage, and there's a good chance that you will do damage. So, uh, you know, that's what we were talking about. And uh, once in a while, the subject comes up at the club. But anyhow, see, I went long. I went off in the weeds. Here's what I'm typically putting in all my pre-selectors and the preamps and so on. And basically, uh, again, let me let me just say this quick. Yellow, input, blue, output. Follow the old retina code. You won't go wrong. You'll love, you'll love yourself for doing that in the future if you build something like uh, this thing into a, a system. You just look at it and say, oh, yeah, the blue's output and the yellow is the input. Uh, anyhow, just to make life easy. Um, but we're, what we're doing is nothing new. Uh, we've got uh, on the input to ground, I've got two resistors here, but we're using anywhere from 10 to 15K to ground. Use carbon comp or uh, carbon film. Don't use wire wound resistors. Uh, that just goes to ground. The typical clipping diodes, I selected these diodes uh, based on the uh, capacity from anode to cathode. And I found four that were around four PFs a piece. Typically, uh, signal diodes and these power diodes will run uh, anywhere from eight to 15 puffs. And you don't want that much capacity to ground. Now, granted, they're in series, so the capacity is going to be half. But still, uh, you get up in frequency, and that becomes a signal shunt. So uh, you want to pick these out. Try to get them in the low, like below 5 PFs. Use your uh, LCR meter and pick out something, you know, that's fairly low. Uh, now we go into a coupling cap. And this thing, uh, I've got a poly and I've got a ceramic here. They're both 0.47, so we end up with about 1 microfarad. Uh in series with the line. I've also got an NE2 to ground. These have some capacity, but they're only going to bother you up around 30 megs or so. Uh, they're one, two, or three uh, picofarads in the worst case. So that's basically the. Uh, let's see if I can get that nice for you. There it is. Yeah, really simple. Nothing new. Uh, Nice and simple on the back. See how small it is? That's my finger. Yep, that's my finger. It's not an elephant's trunk. Uh, there's ground. Here's the signal line. Here's all the stuff connected in between. The schematic looks something like this.
All right, here's the schizophrenic for the uh, this thing here. And it's again, you'll recognize it. You've probably seen it in a whole bunch of that focusing nicely. Here, am I? Come on, come on. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, you've probably seen this in a whole bunch of schematics in the past. Here's the bleeder. I say 10K. You can go 15 or 20 if you want. I wouldn't go much below 10. Some infed antennas are going to be uh, out there in the kill home, so you don't want to do that. The uh, You can use 914s. I use power dials, but again, get something with a low PF across each one of them. Three or four PFs. Uh, the obligatory and requisite in E2. Might, you might want to check that on your LCR meter, too, just to be sure. Uh, the caps, again, you know, belt and suspenders. I wanted both. I put a ceramic and a poly in, and then the output. I've done previous circuits. I've used uh, TVDs, uh, transient voltage diodes, and MOVs across here. Those tend to be way up in uh, uh, element, uh, what, what would you call it, inter-element uh, capacity. Uh one, two, and three hundred PFs. You don't want that across your antenna line. They're fine in power supplies, uh, but unless you could figure out some other kind of arrangement, you don't want to do that. Um, I use them in some of the stuff I've done, but it's been in uh, very, very low frequency uh, work. Uh, I've got them in my loafer receiver. Uh, even in the broadcast band, they do attenuate. So if you're going to put an MOV or a TVD from here to ground, uh, you better be working below the uh, broadcast band. All right, let's go to the uh, let's go to some of the testing we did here. All right, here's the uh, here's the chart, uh, the basic chart, and I'm going to uh, you know what? Let me put this on a tripod. Hang on a second. Count to one, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. All right. I did some uh, quick... You, you know, if you're going to test... You, we're, we're fighting static electricity, and how do you test against that? Well, I've done a couple of things that have been very uh, empirical. Um, one is, <clears throat> on my 160 infed, I've had one of these... Uh, if you can see it here. One of these NE2 bulbs mounted across the antenna to ground and watched the flashing during the storm. Now, it wasn't the lightning hitting anywhere near around here. It was just the uh, charge buildup from the heavy rain and the uh, charged atmosphere building up on the antenna. And every time it gets up around 65 volts or so, this would flash. I actually built one of these with a counter. And I had a photo uh, sensor, what do you call it, photo cell out here. With a counter, I took off my uh, exercise bike. And if you saw me, you'd realize I wasn't using that bike much. Um, but anyhow, I was counting a couple hundred flashes per hour uh, during that storm. And it wasn't a severe storm. It was just a rainstorm. Also in snow. Light, dry snow tends to, uh, to do that. And a very warm, uh, dry, breezy night during the summer. If it's windy, static will build up. So that was the testing we did. I mean, that's that's about all I could do to control static electricity and uh, figure it out on the workbench. <laughs> it's almost impossible. If anybody knows how to bottle up lightning, let me know, and uh, we could take it from there. Uh, but anyhow, by inserting some of these uh, devices in there, and then revisiting this during a storm, you can see the effectiveness. Uh, you seldom or if ever would get a flash out of this just by using the uh, the diodes and the resistors. And of course the caps are all there just to keep whatever is DC out here uh, out of the receiver here on the output uh, and just allow the ACRF to get through. Okay, to the chart. Uh, we'll start here. The red is the... Uh, these are the diodes typically where they would be on the chart uh, as far as capacity goes and shunting to ground. And you can see uh, those PF ratings of, uh, uh, what did I have here, single, uh, 
they're going to be about two kilo, yeah, about two k, um, between one and two k in singles. Well, they're in series, so caps in series are going to be half the value. So we're way up here at three and four k, even at five k if you find some low ones. Well, five k across your line um, isn't going to do anything to even out here to to 30 megs. You're not going to get any shunt effect on the RF signal. Um, the coupling caps, we're down here at uh, 10 ohms and less. Here's uh, two of them in parallel, which comes out to be one mic, a pair of uh, 0.47s. And as you can see, at 10 kilohertz, and if you're a low for a guy, that's where you're going to be down there. Uh, at 10 kilohertz, we're looking at a few ohms. Um, the only other concern was the, uh, the clipper diodes. You have to pay, here's ones that haven't been, uh, hand sorted and they're going to, like I said, they're going to be up at, uh, 10, 12, 15 puffs across the, uh, electrodes, anode to the cathode. And you can start seeing some attenuation just above the uh, broadcast band here, two and three megs. As you get out to, let's just say we're going to stop at 30 megs, uh, you could have uh, like a 7 ohm shunt in terms of impedance. That's why I handpicked them, and I got this way up around 100 ohms here. So uh, we're relatively 80 to 100 ohms. Uh, we're talking about 1S unit or less in the worst case, and really that's not going to happen because we're assuming that this 50 ohm line is your receiver's input. Guess what, guys and girls? I have yet to see a receiver that's 50 ohms input. Even transceivers, Kenwood, Icon, Yezo, any of them. Uh, some of the old Heath Kit and Collins stuff, uh, Allied, and, you know, any of those. We, uh, just for giggles, we've measured uh, input impedance at various frequencies. And throughout their band, typically a general coverage receiver is good down here. Uh, from 100 KC, did I say KC? That's an old guy talking. Uh, 100 kilohertz out to 30 megs. And you're going to find that the input is like this. Uh, they have input circuits, whether they have RF preamps or not, most of them do. If they don't, they're not very good radios. If you go directly into the converter, the uh, the uh, oscillator mixer stage, uh, that's old school. You're going back to the old Halicrafter, early, early Halicrafter stuff. And, uh, probably pre or post-war, World War II. But the newer stuff always has uh, an RF stage. And even there, they have coils and bandpass filters and protection circuits and so on. And uh, that stuff is uh, reactive. And you're going to get swings. I've seen them go as high as three and 400 ohms up to here and down here to 10 and 20 ohms. So we call them 50. 50 is nominal, but you're going to see the swing. Watch the pointer, girls and boys, like this. And it's going to do it on odd harmonics all the way through. I'm sorry, even in odd harmonics all the way through. You're going to see the peaks in the valleys. Um, so there you are. Went real long. Okay. Well, Bob, in one KPR, leave your comments below. And where? I think down here, right? Is that my pointing to the comments? I think it's down there. Uh, if you have questions and so on. This is an interesting topic. Like I said, these things have been around forever. Or this type of stuff. Uh, I just decided to make up a bunch of boards and have them handy so when the next project comes along, uh, just reach in a box and throw them in. And again, uh, you can take a lot more liberties here with protection if you're working low for If you're down below the broadcast band here uh, and below, you can start using the TVDs and the MOVs down there. I would select them for like uh, 20 or 38 volt clipping. Uh, or even 40 and 50 if you want. But remember, when you're working these low bands, you're going to be working with very long wire antennas. And you're going to be picking up a lot of static electricity. Um, and if there's a nearby strike, you're going to get a whole... I can't say that word on YouTube. You're going to get a whole load 
<laughs> of EMF. Lots of volts and uh, maybe an amp or two. You don't want that in the front end of your radio. Okay, that's it. I got to go shovel snow. Damn it. <sighs> Winter in New England. Hey, stay COVID free. We love you all. In one KPR. www.bobsamerica.com. See you later.